We got a really cool question on Twitter the other day, and we decided, why not start our first Q&A segment? Today we talk about puzzles. I am Chris. And I'm Matt. Welcome to Roleplay Chat. And welcome... No, I keep doing that. I, I keep... We are two game masters who can't stop talking about roleplaying games. And like we said, today we're talking about puzzle. It comes from a, a question we had on Twitter from Laughing Vrock. Yeah, it's a really cool question. And thank you, Laughing Vrock, for sending it our way. Should I just start yeah. reading it up? Let's just go... Let's go right into it. So Laughing Vrock says... One... Puzzles. I love puzzles. Personally, or making a mistake already. I got I got a script that I can't even read. <laughs> Personal experience is players dislike puzzles. How do you keep players interested? So, as is the first part of this uh, question, is the statement about our experience. So, I think have you felt like that? Like, firstly, do you like puzzles? I love puzzles. I really do. I I like them a lot. And I like puzzles, I mean, I like puzzles as a person. Mm -hmm. So when a puzzle is put in a game, I find it a lot of fun. I usually just like, I'm no, my, I'm no longer my character anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's how how you feel with puzzles. I, 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 mm, I ha as a player, I feel like it's also the, the, the way I see it too. Uh, we both have a background in mathematics. I think that might... Because we do math a lot. When we have a puzzle, it's fun. We kind of like uh, it's it's a Get game for us. Really excited about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> we're nerds. Surprise, surprise. Um, and um, yeah, so it's it's difficult to, to 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 bridge the gap between the player and the character and having role play. And today we're gonna talk about that uh, in more detail. But I feel like it's it's definitely something that happens to us. Um, I know. I, I I thought I didn't like puzzles uh, before playing with you because in the past I had. A game master giving puzzles that were more about if you don't have the exact answer I want, mm. you're dying, <laughs> like you're gonna die. And again, another problem, a typical problem with uh, with puzzles, or or at least if you don't succeed, you're you're stuck there until you succeed, and we're basically putting a pause on any everything else. And again, that's something we're gonna talk more. But as a game master, have you felt like putting puzzles like players would dislike them? Um, no, actually, I, I can't say I, that, that Laughing Brock's statement resonates with me, but part of it actually, part of the reason I originally included puzzles in my games when I, when I game master is because I was actually asked by my players to include them. Mm -hmm. Um, I played for a long time with my, my now with my, with my wife, but back then she was my girlfriend and I played with her and a few of her friends and to them, the, one of their favorite parts about playing in my, in my game was the puzzle. Like, they, they almost, at, at the end of a game, when, when there wasn't a puzzle, they'd be like, oh, I really, uh, there wasn't a puzzle this week. <laughs> so, yeah. so, to me, it was, it came from their desire. And here when I'm saying puzzle, I mean like very literal, one of yeah. these puzzles that you're referring to where there's only one solution. It's very much like a, out of like a video game or, or something that I would inspire from, from something like this. Like, yeah, that's a puzzle. Good. Did you have that here prepared? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for for those of you listening, Chris pulled out a Rubik's cube. Yeah. Um, Thank you uh, for pointing that out. Actually. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think that I think that's interesting. It's on the demand of the player. Uh -huh. And you you mentioned something about um, having the player ask for it as a very important part of their experience. And to me, I thought of the three pillars of uh, role play, combat, and exploration. I'm like. Puzzle kind of, I, I'm not sure where That's they a fit. Good point, right? They they might fit in exploration. You can put them there. Yeah. You could put them in combat. It would be just like an element that's kind of. It's not really. It's not combat. And like, and it's it can. It's it not can, role play. It, it can enhance combat. It can yeah, enhance it can. exploration. I think that is that what you're getting with this. It's, yeah, I, th I think it's like it's it, it doesn't go anywhere, but it could go everywhere kind mm -hmm, of deal. Mm -hmm. But if I had to put it in one, it would be by default exploration because it's so different from the t two others. It's kind of exploring, like if it's a door that has a puzzle on it, it could be part of the exploration to actually solve it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Uh, so the second half of the question is, how do you keep players interested? 
So how do we keep player interested? So if I kind of put both of the questions for me personally, I, I never had the feeling that my players were bored with a puzzle I put mm -hmm. because I worry a lot about that. I, I felt I feel like I've I, I've come up with ways for people for players to be very invested in the puzzle and make them relevant for the story, stuff like that. For instance, being relevant to the story is a way to keep keep them interested. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mechanical thing going with puzzles. Um, but let me throw it uh, back at you, actually. What's the main thing that comes in your head when you're trying to establish a good puzzle? Um, I mean, making making sure that they're interesting. I, I think for me, I, I try, especially in my more recent game mastering, I try not to make explicit puzzles. Mm. For me, puzzles that only have one solution have their place when the players ask for them, or as like a a fun additional thing to do. It's a bit gimmicky. But it can mm. feel a little bit gimmicky. So I can I can see why Laughing Rocks players might not really resonate with puzzles. So instead, when I when I put something that I consider to be close to a puzzle, usually it's more like a challenge, you know, a, mm. an environment or a space with an obstacle. It could be like a big pit and you got to get across the pit. Or there's a, there's a, all these different levers, and some of them open doors, and some of them don't, and some of them zap you. I mean, that could be considered a puzzle, but it's yeah. not really like there's one sequence of levers that the players need to do to open up the one door they have to go through. There'll be a bunch of different levers, and some of them open up some cool doors, some of them open up a pit, and someone falls in and gets hurt, and it might feel like there's a wrong answer, but it never feels like an answer is completely vetoed. Um, sometimes I don't even know what the answer is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so you you just create something and you just don't know how they're going to solve it. You basically prepare the building blocks, but not necessarily what they're going to end up with. Yeah, yeah, pr pretty much. Um, a lot of my one-shots are like this, where it's like there's a mission, you're going on a heist, or you're going to kidnap someone, mm -hmm. or you're going to go do something. And to me, the puzzle is, how do you get into this place without getting found? Mm -hmm. I make a place, I put guards, I put stuff in the way. How are they going to get in? I don't know. And maybe this is a very conceptual idea of what a puzzle might be. Yeah. Um, and I think you're, you're touching on something interesting there, where a puzzle could be seen as a Rubik's Cube, but it could also... like w Whenever you're using Ingenuity, mm -hmm. you're kind of doing some kind of puzzle, right? D and D or any kind of role play is really conducive to, to this because any challenges that, that are put in front of you, you can come up with your own answer and see it as, as a puzzle. I know you like from playing in your game. A lot of the combat feel like a puzzle with fighting in it mm. and also role play opportunity. Like it's all it's all mixed together, but it's about okay. I need to first figure out how to get into this place of the map. And then I get in. And once I'm in, I need to figure out how this cannon works. And then how, where are the, the, the balls to put in the cannon. And once I figure out how to use it, I can shoot and actually succeed at the combat while the other ones are defending. It, it, I, I'm glad you feel that way because mm -hmm. yeah, I make I put a lot of active effort into combat actually. To me, swinging and attacking isn't very fun. I want there to be an additional layer of complexity usually it comes out in this form of, of, mm -hmm. of puzzle uh, so it's not like like uh, we were talking about the pillars before it's interesting now that we are talking about the the puzzle being the combat being the puzzle uh -huh. because it's not like okay here's a rubik's cube we're, we're we're fighting you need to solve that before you can hit right it, it wouldn't make any sense so it feels like it should be really different but like this we could you, we could make it all together so maybe that's that's Half of an answer. I make it interesting by including it in other activities. A, a puzzle on its own can be fun if the players want it, but otherwise it might not be that interesting. So try to make it part of combat. P try to make it part of a social interaction. Oh man, that could be really cool. Mm -hmm. can, can you think of other things, Chris? Uh, other pillars that puzzles could be really interesting in? I think for for exploration, I can see it like... Obviously, we could just stop the game and have in front of a door and solve a puzzle. But for me, something that feels very puzzly is an infiltration. Yeah. Um, so you're not in the combat. You're, you're figuring out how to, to go somewhere. Like, if you put a map in front of the players, 
that gives them partial information. It's interesting. And they're trying to solve the, the optimal way or what could that mean on the map? Is there a way to figuring it out? Mm -hmm. So I think it's it goes hand in hand with exploration. Um, and it gives the same it gives the same feeling. So that I think we're we're kind of trying to like cop out of using actual puzzle by saying like it's everywhere else. But what I'm saying is because it could be part of everything else kind of at the background, you can give the same feeling of a puzzle without actually giving uh, a stop to the game and having them solve a, some mm -hmm. kind of a box to open. It or could a be fun. Or something. Yeah, yeah, it could be very fun and I've used it. I, I use it very sparingly because players tend to do what you said at the beginning. Like they tend to say, okay, let's all focus on that thing. And then you have to manage if you have five players, is there stuff to do for five players yeah again that might be a like something to think about when you design it so that's why i like to have a puzzle that's on the side of what's going on i could be exploration could be combat could be whatever it could be social if you want but if you manage that the, the maybe two players that are actually interested in solving a puzzle will go towards that where the other ones will do the rest mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. they need to scout maybe they need to fight whatever it is and that way you don't impose doing a puzzle because I think people that like it maybe like it a lot yeah. but people that dislike it really they don't want to take their Friday to go solve Rubik's Cubes they want to maybe smash doors or they want to role play or they, whatever they, they like in a role playing game and, and to add to that Chris when you do that in a situation like combat to me it's perfect because combat does have a lot of time where you're taking turns you're going from one person to the next well all that time between my turn or your turn or whoever whoever's acting if I'm the one that's invested in this puzzle I can spend that whole time thinking about it I can mm -hmm. spend the whole time looking at the map trying to decide which of the five holes need to have the rock pushed into to be able to open the gate or whatever because I can I can like puzzle it out on my own take little notes on my paper or what have you while the others do their turns and then when it comes back to my turn I swing my sword or I do my action and then I go on I go back to trying to solve the puzzle. Mm -hmm. If you are thinking of using a puzzle, uh, they, they, they're stuck, they need to move forward. I think something we need to make sure we do is the cost of trying different combinations. Let's say it's a combination lock of, of some kind. Oh, yeah. If, if, yeah. if they can just try 17 combination, maybe it's okay, maybe, uh, maybe it's fine. But if you want to give an actual like penalty of trying the, those combination, what I like to do is it almost starts a timer or and and or wasn't it? We'll say my we will say the French yeah. came out. There. Oh <laughs> yeah, my French Canadian came out. Uh, okay, uh, what I was saying is yeah, you could just basically trigger an encounter, right? You they they have a time to figure out. They see it. They see the pillar that they have to figure out. All the team looking at it. Oh wait wait. One of them tries something and then uh, something clicks, mm -hmm. and there are bugs coming from the walls or there are goblins that are alarm, uh, alarmed. And that means, okay, we not only have to solve this puzzle, we have to make sure we're alive to, to, to solve it. And maybe there's a timer that constant reinforcement. So basically, it's you can put all of them together uh, yeah. pretty easily, I think. Um, something that this reminds me of, mm -hmm. and something that, that I do, Chris, actually, when I make my puzzles, is I actually follow a philosophy that, that I think Nintendo game designers use and it's it's like a, the Super Mario philosophy. Okay. So a lot of a lot of levels in the Super Mario games, I'm all, and I don't know if there's any gamers that are listening or watching, but um, the video game players, I should say, because gamers we're all tabletop. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I digress. Uh, their design philosophy for games in the Mario levels is usually you start with an introduction to a concept, then you let the player mess around with that concept mm. in an environment where they can't get hurt so like let's say the concept is doing a double jump well the oh, first yeah. thing is mm -hmm. you let them run around in open space second thing is you let them you, you give them an obstacle they have to double jump over it but if they fall they don't fall into anything dangerous you can just walk back to the top of the mountain and try again the, the third phase is where it gets serious this is where there's lava in the hole and you got to jump over the lava and if you make a mistake this time your character loses a life so I try to follow the same philosophy when I make a, when I make a puzzle, mm. or at least when it's doable, and it it makes the players feel I think less frustrated with the puzzle, because if I just toss something that has this major consequence, if they don't get it right, 
That doesn't feel fair. Uh, to have this progression is very interesting and a safe way to make sure it's not going to be confusing. Because that's another thing for puzzle that are problematic. If you if you see that your players are confused, you kind of lost them, yeah. right? If yeah. they're not sure what they have to do, or what I would say, if if they're not sure what you mean, let's say you have description and you're not using uh, handouts or anything, you're, you're just saying what it looks like. If they don't have the exact image you have in your head, it might be problematic oh, for, for them sure. to solve it. So, so that's where maybe handouts, maybe drawings, or maybe just making sure everything is clear by um, just repeating stuff or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. making sure we're all on the same page is very important, especially when doing puzzles. Yeah, for sure. I hope that answers your question, Laughing Brock. I, I know it. It we kind of skirted around it a little bit. <laughs> Something I didn't really have a chance to talk about that's really uh, important for me when creating puzzles is uh, the fact that I want the players to feel like there's a progression. So the feeling of getting stuck when solving a puzzle is the most frustrating thing ever. I hate it. So there's different ways to, to, to solve that problem, but I like to put layers of small things they can solve and they, they feel that they're moving forward. It could be going from one room to the next. It could be getting one click out of four clicks that you need to get. Anything you can think of, of giving partial success is, is, is great because it gives feedback also like, yeah, we're on the, the right track. We're not doing an hour of solving and I have no idea. No, we're doing it 15 minutes. Okay, now the new thing. Yeah, and, so, and that's why a lot of these like escape room game things are really mm -hmm. popular, right? Because it's a collection of small puzzles. Yeah. Uh, you feel like each little piece is a progression towards a greater end game. I don't know if you, if people watching have done an escape, but imagine doing an escape that takes, I don't know, what are they, 45, 40 minutes? I don't know how long they are. Uh, I think it's between 30 and an hour, depending yeah, on the Yeah, let's company. go with 40 minutes. But instead of having like, oh, I get the ball and then I can put in the thing and get the key. And let's say it's just one big thing and you just get to open the door at the end. That, that's, that's, that's work, right? That you don't, you need the little clicks every time to get positive reinforcement that you're doing things right. Anyway, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that's very important for me is reducing the gap between player and character. So if we go back to what you were saying at the beginning, the, mm -hmm. oh, now I get a puzzle, I can stop being my character and I'm just me solving it. The way I, I like to reduce this gap is I like to give um, something that the player can work on, but that the character can help through skills. Mm -hmm. So for those who watch Blood and Betrayal, uh, this example is going to come from it, but the letter is kind of a riddle. And in my head, riddles are a bit... They're puzzly. They're, they're language puzzles. And there was a lot of aspects to solve this. The players could solve it by themselves, but I would make the characters make skill checks to figure out some parts and it would give information to the players to solve the thing more easily mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and using their background. And you, so there's a lot of different ways to, 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 to do that. Um, maybe one last thing, unless you wanted to Well, I was in. just going to say mm -hmm. part of this, if you want to like try to conceptualize it, is that when you're putting the characters in front of a puzzle... You want to be able to engage both elements, the, the character's knowledge and the player's knowledge. And if you can kind of find a way to get both of these elements incorporated into solving the puzzle, that's when I think you've achieved this balance that Chris is talking about. Yeah, and, and to give uh, one last part, uh, I'm out of the frame, I'm back. Um, here is a box. So this box is, uh, maybe some of you know it. It's uh, an escape room you can buy, and there's like four escape rooms that comes with it, but escape room you can do at home. Um, in one of the games uh, for the Blood and Betrayal, I took that and I created an adventure. Uh, they had to go through a temple to retrieve something. And the way I, I saw, I, I kind of designed it is when you buy that kind of game, you usually have things to solve and you get hints. If after two minutes you're not at this point, you'll get a hint. Well, that, all those hints yeah. I would give through skill check. They would not necessarily get it if they, they fell their skill check. But, oh, you roll a notice check to notice that the corpse has a letter on them or an investigation check. You roll a knowledge to understand that the glyphs might work together. All those hints would be put through a skill check. Um, yeah, and, and that worked great. Like, it, it worked very well. Mm -hmm. I Obviously, I did that escape before. 
I studied it and there was three parts to it. And the last part was like the last seven minutes of the, the hour of this escape. And I made that part optional. So they, they only had really to reach it to, to fulfill the objective of the quest. They had to succeed at the first two. And the third one was for treasures. Laughing Brock, I hope we answered your question or, or in some regards, uh, we, we shed some light on, on the, the topic you brought forward. Uh, this being said, Chris and I realized that this episode is a little bit messy. I know we kind of talked about different things and it wasn't super structured. Uh, to be honest, that was kind of the intention, mm -hmm. right, Chris? Uh, we, we wanted this episode to be kind of similar to our deep dive conversations, our longer podcast versions uh, of our conversations. So maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about uh, the new structure that we're looking to, to do. Yeah, so we used to do one very long and then do a short version of like the takeaway of the long video. So what we're going to do now is we're, we're trying to really engage the community more and not just come up with our own questions. Yeah. Um, we we want to hear your questions. And that's why we're really happy that the Laughing Rock uh, participated because it, it gives us fuel. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take Q&As to fuel our discussion, do a, I don't know, 15 to maximum maybe 30 minutes. Probably this video is going to be on the longer side. And once we have this, we'll do again the short. That's more from our views and stuff we we've, people seem to, to to prefer that mm -hmm. and we love doing them so we're and for the podcast you'll get this uh match together of the q a's and the short one the short one we're actually not on podcast uh previously so you'll get this new thing it's going to be uh, more like freeform and then really structured yeah. and we hope you enjoy it and those those short ones are kind of like more takeaways so tips tricks or even just uh, like lists of considerations for you as a listener or a viewer to consider when you plan your games, when you game master or, or what have you. I would also like to take this opportunity to, to thank Laughing Brock for their question. Uh, there was a second part to the question talking about traps. Maybe we're going to get to that in another episode. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to call out to everybody who's listening and watching. If you have questions, please engage with us. So you can do that by reaching out to us on Twitter. It's at Role underscore play underscore chat. Or there's always the email that's contact roleplay chat at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And thanks, Chris. Thanks, Matt. Let's call it a chat. I tried something. Yeah, it works. <laughs> <laughs>